Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says, Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, beheld there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise man, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, notice that, when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful story. It reminds us that a Savior has been born. Help us as we look at your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to bring to you a thought that I've titled, Following a Star and Finding a Shack. Following a Star and Finding a Shack. Now as I begin to think about what has happened in this particular story, I want to begin by asking a question have you ever noticed how life doesn't always turn out? It doesn't always turn out the way that we carefully plan for life to turn out. Now, with that being asked, sometimes circumstances doesn't really follow our plans. And often it seems that life is nothing more than a series of shattered dreams. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now here's some wise men. These wise men had spent, by theological terms, some Bible scholars say, two years. Two years following a star. Now, to follow this star, they had left everything that they knew behind them. And no doubt these wise men were wealthy men. I mean, we can see that they were wealthy by the gifts that they had to offer. So no doubt they had left a very promising place to follow a star. They had left their country and they were now strangers and pilgrims 
in a land that they knew nothing about, but yet they followed the star. And then when they finally arrived to their particular destination, they find that the star that they've been following over is at an humble house instead of a royal palace. Now, these men had probably dreamed of finding the Messiah in a palace. Now, preacher, why would you say that? Well, where's the first place that they went? They went to a palace. Amen? They went to Herod's palace, trying to find out just a little bit more about who uh, this king was that was going to be born. And, and they shared the story of how they had been following a star. But needless to say, they continued to journey on. Now I'm sure that they found that where the star finally rested, it was not a place that would match up with the dreams that was probably in their head. In fact, they found the king of kings in the home of a peasant, probably in a home that was no more than just a shack. That's all that it probably was, just, just a little shack where Mary and Joseph had set up their abode. Now, no doubt... I believe that there's no doubt that their, their dreams were shattered. They were shattered before them. And uh, yet, amid the rumble of their torn and twisted dreams, these wise men found some things in that humble setting that changed their lives forevermore. Now, I want to share with you three things quickly that God has blessed me with as I think about maybe this happening the way that I've shared with you. First of all, wise men recognize God in the shacks of life. That's a pretty good point right there. Wise men recognize God in the shacks of life. Now it wasn't that what they had expected. But they came to worship. And worship they did. They saw God in that shack on this particular day. They saw God in this little baby called Jesus. When life shatters your dreams. Hear me church. When life shatters your dreams. Your first duty when those shattered dreams are thrown out before your eyes, it's to see the Lord in those shattered dreams. Amen. If you look, you'll find him. Yes, you will. Oh, praise God. I look back at some of the dreams that I've had in my life that's been shattered and broken all to pieces. And when I was going through the shattered dreams and the things that I had laid up for self and the the ideas that I had had for prosperity for self and all of that just broke all to pieces wondering where God was in it all. Yep. And now I look back and I see that he was there all the time. If you are his, hear me when I say this, if you are his, there is nothing that will ever happen in your life that he doesn't have control of. In fact, some of the things that maybe shattered your dreams are things that maybe he allowed to happen to bring you to a place of where you needed to be. Amen. Now, when your star leads you to a shack, you remember that God is doing one of three things. When I preach it, what is he doing? Number one, he might be bringing you to a place of correction. Did you hear me? Now, we don't like to be corrected. We're living in a society where no one likes to be corrected. You see, 
We think that we're right in everything that we do at all times. And, and we don't like to be corrected. But I'm here to tell you that we serve a God that can bring us to a place of correction. I am so glad that God loves me enough that whenever I step outside of the will of God that he can bring me back to a place of, that I need to be. Now, preacher, how will he bring correction? Well, there's different ways. That's exactly right, brother. Many different ways. It could be a health issue. It could be a broke issue. <laughs> it could be many other issues. But God knows how to use the rod of correction. And he, he knows exactly what he needs to do in our lives to draw us back to a place that we need to be with him. Now listen, when your star leads you into a shack, remember that God is doing one of three things. Number two, what is he doing? He's bringing me to a place of instruction. Now, I never have been one that liked to be instructed. I mean, uh, I was one of those who always thought that I knew enough. Amen. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I never did like instructors too much. I remember when I went into service, I had a drill instructor, and me and him were not friends. We were not friends. And I said something to him one time that just really got under his skin just a little bit. And I won't ever forget him carrying me down to a place and pulling off that drill sergeant's hat and laying it aside, and he said, I am no longer your drill instructor. He said, now we're going to take care of business. Thank God I had enough sense to let him be my instructor. <laughs> Thank God I had enough sense to let him be my instructor. But you see, it didn't start there. I could tell you stories about teachers that tried to instruct me and teach me. Uh, I, I, hate to, I hate to admit it, but my little wife met a few of them before they went on to be with the Lord. And, and what's really good to me is every now and then I... I would run up with one of my old teachers that taught me years ago, and they'd say, Danny Ray, what are you doing now? Oh, I'm a preacher. You're what? <laughs> You're what? <laughs> but hey, sometimes God brings us to a place of instruction, and he's trying to reveal himself to us and to show himself to us in a new way. Now, Listen, when your star leads you to a shack, remember there, there are three things that he's trying to do. Number one, correction. Number two, instruction. Number three, he's trying to do his best to perfect you. Now, I look out at you this morning, and boy, y'all need some of that. Y'all need a bunch of that. In fact, whenever I was working this sermon up, I looked in the mirror, and I said, boy, I need some of that. Listen, he's trying to mold each one of us into his likeness, into an image of, like him. You know, we ought to be so close to God that whenever we walk by somebody that they can feel the spirit of God that has taken up residence in us. Yes, amen. And that's exactly what God is trying to do as he perfects us, as, as he works out all of the flaws. Don't look at me spiritual like you don't have any flaws. We all have flaws. Every one of us have flaws. I mean, we do, really. I was sitting in the Sunday school room this morning, and my wife looked at me and she says, Lord, your eyebrows. Oh. She said, I need to trim them things. I said, well, honey, I thought you'd forgot about me. <laughs> I mean, right there in the Sunday school class, she saw some of the imperfections, some of those things that weren't just perfect. Only my wife would see that. And I just love getting ready to go to church sometimes. I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. She polished me when I found her. I'm not going to lie to you. She really did. She, she, she polished me when she found me. And, I, and every now and then, the old Danny still... <laughs> Hey, every now and then the old Danny will still come out. And I, I come out one morning in, in, a, in a suit and a tie and all of this stuff. I said, honey, does this match? And this is what she said. 
I'm not saying anything. You know what I learned from that? I better go change. <laughs> she tries to perfect me. That's the way God is. See, God's trying to make us perfect. He's trying to mold us and make us into his image. And he tries to polish us. The biggest thing that we got to do, though, is to allow him to instruct us as he polishes us. You see, when your star leads you to a shack, stop. Look for God, because he'll be there. He'll be there. Number two, wise men render gifts in the shack of life. Wise men render gifts in the shack of life. Now, I'm going to say this. I believe that it would have been an easy thing for these three men to have turned around and we say, we say that they were three. I mean, we sing the song, We Three Kings. The Bible doesn't really say they were three, but we just, we just really believe because there were three gifts, there were three wise men. So I'm going to just, just say that they were three, okay? Would that be all right? So, so here they are. It would have been easy for these, these, these three men to have turned around, packed up everything that they had brought with them, and went home, with this attitude. Man, I thought we was coming to see a king. And here we have went up to an old shack. And two old poor people in the shack don't have much with a little baby. Boy, we missed it. We've been following that star for two years. And look what we found. Look what we found. Just two old poor people and a little baby. That would have been an easy thing for them to do that. But listen, I mean, stop and think about it. Would you blame them? That's probably what we'd have done. Come on. You know I'm telling you the truth. That's probably what we'd have done. We'd have just, we'd have just picked up what we had brought and we'd have left. Now, if it hadn't turned out like they planned, but it turned out just like they planned. You see, they didn't mind giving Jesus what was rightfully his. Because they were able to see Jesus for who he really was. When your star leads you into a shack, that's the time that you need to give your best. When I preach, wait a minute, you don't understand. When I'm in a shack, I don't really have anything to give. How many of you remember Jesus setting and watching as everybody began to bring their offering. And many of those people had plenty. But there was one little widow who didn't have any. All she had was less than one cent. And she walked up and she dropped it into the offering plate. I love when Jesus takes the time to teach. All those disciples was probably saying among themselves, don't you know he's proud of that fella over there? He dropped in a $100 bill. Don't you know he's happy there? My goodness, look over here. See, that fella dropped in a $1,000 bill. I don't even know if that things exist. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> hey, <coughs> but here's this little lady. She walks up and don't have much, and she drops in what she has. And Jesus looked at his disciples, and he said, "She's given more than everybody because she lives in a shack." And she has given everything that she has. When you find yourself in a shack, it's then that it's time to give. Listen, most people respond to the shack by, bless God, I'm about to get out of this shack. Don't we? I'm going to do something to get out of this shack. Most people will stop giving a lot of times when they find themselves 
in a shack situation. Well, I just don't have anything to give. Well, that's the wrong response. The wrong response. The way to get from God is to give to God. Now, preacher, I, I don't agree with you. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Malachi 3.10, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse. That there may be meat in mine house, saith the Lord. Prove me herewith, saith the God of hosts. If I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there'll be not enough room to receive it. Yes, God expects for us to give. Not because he needs our money, but out of obedience. Amen. Years ago, I used to go to a nursing home and preach every now and then. There was an old Church of God pastor that would come and hear me preach. Back in those days, I'd say, bless God, God owns a cattle of a thousand hills. And every time I'd say that, he'd say, yes, and all the taters under the hill, preacher. <laughs> That's what he'd say. And that's so true. You see, these wise men, I believe, receive far more back than they gave away. And that's always the way that God works. Amen. You see, there was a time in my life that, that I didn't feel like I was able to give anything. But whenever I started giving, God began to give me everything. Not so much in money and, 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 and financial blessings, but, but he began to give me things that, that I took for granted more wisdom, more knowledge. And yes, he did bless me with things. Hey, I remember last year, the last day, the last day that I had to send in our taxes. And me and my precious little wife had prayed over those things, had cried over that, because we had to come up with a good bit of money, and we didn't have it. We'd start throwing a little change in an account every now and then when we had it to throw in. And it was either the day before or the day of. Marta said, you know we've got to send those taxes off today or tomorrow. I said, yeah, I know it. I didn't say it like that, though. I said, yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, mm. I groaned in my spirit because in my heart I knew that we didn't have it to send in. And she says, how much we got to send in? And I opened that little file where I keep those tax papers and I gave her the figure. First time I ever saw my wife have a shouting spell. I thought she was sick. And I looked over and tears was running down her face. I said, honey, what is it? I don't remember whether it was 89, 79, or 29 cents, but we had exactly what we needed plus 29 cents, I'll say. <laughs> then I had me a shouting spell, glory to God. <laughs> God will always bless you if you'll just let him bless you. You see, not very many are willing to give. But if we'll just give, even when we find ourselves in a shack position, the surest way to be blessed by God is to, to be a blessing to God. Amen. And we pray all the time, oh God bless my family. Oh, God bless our nation. Oh, God bless, God bless, God bless. Listen, it's time for us to bless God for blessing us. Amen. He deserves to be blessed. And then the third thing, the final thing, wise men receive grace in the shacks of life. Wise men receive grace in the shacks of life. You see, while these men were there, I believe that they experienced two kinds of grace. First of all, I believe they experienced saving grace. God saved them, 
And I believe that God saved them because he was directing their lives. Somebody said, when I preach away, wait a minute, they're just following the star. They're following the star because God directed them to follow the star. So they experienced saving grace. Now the second thing that I believe they experience is they experience sustaining grace. Sustaining grace. God saved them. He directed their lives. And, and listen, when our star leads us to a shack, we can expect to find God's grace in our hour of need. I've never not found God's grace in an hour of need. I've always found God's grace in an hour of need. Paul, the great apostle of God, the Bible said that he had a thorn in his flesh. You look for it, you got one too. Everybody's got a thorn in their flesh. From time to time, that thorn will show up. Mine showed up last night. <laughs> Boy, I had a backache. That's a thorn in the flesh. Thorn in the flesh. But now listen to me. We don't know necessarily what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it was. Bible scholar says, well, Paul wrote big in the manuscripts and, and, and he was probably blind. I don't know that. I don't know what his thorn in the flesh was, but I do know this. He asked God three times. Three times. Three times. God, Lord, remove this thorn in the flesh. Remove it. And listen to what? The Lord said to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. God, just remove it. And he said to me, my grace is enough. <laughs> my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Life is seldom fair. Did you hear me? Life is seldom fair. Especially for those of us who call Jesus our Lord. I mean, we can just think of time and time and time again whenever it would look like Satan is winning a battle. Life is seldom fair. Many times life is not what we think that it ought to be. But listen to me. Even when life lets us down, God never will. God never will. He won't ever let you down. When our star leads us to a shack, we can expect God to provide leadership. We can expect God to provide guidance as we find ourselves in the shack. When I preach, how do you know that? Because Jesus told us he'd do that. In John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse number 13, he said, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you to all truth. And you see, when Jesus departed 40 days after the resurrection, ascended, sitting on the right hand of God, making intercession for you and I, when he ascended, the spirit of truth took up residence. When I preach, where did he take up residence? In me. In you. Those of you who are saved by the grace of God, the spirit of truth has taken up residence in, in you. Amen. And as, as God's children, we're never alone. We're never alone. And we're never without resources never without resources what are you talking about I'm talking about this whenever you don't think you have anything if you got Jesus you got everything Amen. 
You got everything. I had a shack experience one time. Lost everything I ever worked for. Don't look at me spiritual because were it not for the grace of God, it could have been you. Lost everything I ever worked for. Didn't even own a vehicle. I had a lease vehicle that I was driving. And it was due to be turned back in in about six months. Didn't know what I was going to do for a way to go. Houses. Had more than one. I had two. Had two houses. Lost them both. I had a job that I created. God led me to create. Lost that too. That job that I created was bringing in about $6,000 a month. Lost it. Lost it. Was pastoring a little small church in Osceola, Georgia. Because of some of the things I went through, I decided that I didn't need to stay there. So I resigned. Lost it. Lost it. Moved back into the house where my sainted old mama, thank God I had her then. Had a place to go. Didn't want to stay there very long though because I felt like, <laughs> I learned real quick like that she thought I was still two years old. <laughs> and that's the way she treated me. And I had to remind her, Mama, I'm a grown man. She said, yeah, but you still my baby and shook that walking stick at me. I said, yes, ma'am. Wasn't two months later that God sent me to a healing station up in Arabia, Georgia. Sent me to a little church up in Arabia, Georgia. And whenever they called me, they said, Preacher, we got a nice little house for you to live in. And I'd made the statement when I left this church a long time ago that I'd never live in another pastoral. Or maybe it wasn't this church. It might have been Spring Head. I don't remember. But I made the statement, I won't ever live in nobody else's pastoral. God reminded me of that when I moved into that one. <laughs> And let me tell you something, I was glad to get it, brother. I was glad to get it. Listen, I was. Glad to get it. But I had a house to live in, didn't have no furniture, didn't have nothing, didn't have nothing. But by the end of the week, by the end of the week, God restored. God restored everything. Everything. That I lost. Restored it all. All of it. When I preached, he didn't give you your house back. No. But God taught me through all of that that even when you have a shack experience, that if you'll just look, Jesus is there. He's there. He'll always make a way for us and support us through the shacks of life. Now let me ask you something as we close. Have you ever been following a star and you wound up in a shack? Surrounded by the debris of a shattered hope or a dream? Some of you may be there right now. I don't know. But I want to tell you something. If you look, Jesus is in your shack. He's working on your behalf and he's concerned about your need. Not your greed, your need. So what we need to do is we need to do just what the wise men did. They fell down on their face before God. That little baby. And they worshipped him. And they laid their gifts at his feet. Preacher, I don't know what to give him. I don't have anything to give him. All he wants is you. All he wants is you. And if you'll just give yourself to him, you've given him exactly what he wants. Stand with me. Father,
I've given to your people, that that you've given to me. Use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.